Good morning or good afternoon to everybody, wherever you are. My name is Lucia Shalakwa from the company MVG. This workshop has been organized in the frame of the 14th European Conference on Antennas and Propagation, and it presents the key advantages of combining measurements and simulations for antenna applications. For more information and questions, you can contact us writing to my email address here reported. We will be glad to answer to your questions. We have structured the workshop as follows. After an introduction about the motivation of using measurement and simulation combined together, I would like to show in details the workflow implementing the link between measured and simulated data. With particular attention to the measurement of the device under test, the preparation of the measured data in terms of near features, and its final integration in computation electromagnetic tools for simulation of simple and complex scenarios. Then I would continue to present the campaign carried out to validate the link between measurement and simulation by some examples and showing the accuracy reached by this method. Then I will switch to describe some practical applications of the link and based on the calculation of the equivalent currents on different electromagnetic areas. But before starting with the technical part, I would make an introduction about MVG. The Microvision Group, known also as MVG, founded in March 2008, combines four industry leaders, Satimo, OrbitFR, EMI, and Rainford EMC systems. MVG offers a system that allows for visualization of the electromagnetic waves while evaluating the characteristics of the antennas, performing EMC tests, and helping speed up the development of products using microwave frequencies. The MVG solution portfolio involves antenna, antenna measurement, positioning equipment, SAR measurement, absorbers, EMC, NAP2Link, industrial control, and area safety. MVG has an international presence in nine countries, including seven production sites. The first task of the workshop consists of motivation of combining measurement and simulations for antenna applications. We will focus on the advantages that left this approach interesting in the different electromagnetic areas. The electromagnetic analysis in complex scenarios requires the decomposition technique. This widely occurs for antenna placement problems. In all the applications, the overall accuracy of the numerical simulation is highly dependent on the accuracy of the antenna representation. High fidelity results can be reached if the electromagnetic models of the antenna are available, but often it doesn't occur. Indeed, the antenna suppliers, in order to protect the intellectual property of the antenna design, are reluctant to share their electromagnetic models with the antenna manufacturers that need to integrate the antennas on the different platforms. The link between measurement and simulation can overcome this problem. Whether the electromagnetic models are not available, or in case of on-shelf antennas, Different approaches can be used. The first option is based on simulation, creating a CAD model of an equivalent or similar antenna. The second approach, if the antenna is available, is to measure the radiation patterns, create a near field representation of the antenna, and import it in simulation tool in the final structure. The third possibility is the full measurement of the final scenario. Considering all the approaches, importing the antenna measurement in simulation means creating an effective link. This approach is highly recommended when the CAD model is not available, or if we can have only the simulated model. Moreover, it is also recommended when a full measurement of this scenario is not possible, since such big system is not accessible, like for large structures or vehicles. 
Thus, the link allows to use the real representation of the antennas and does not require large measurement systems for their characterization. Summarizing, the link between measurement and simulations allows to share antenna data without exposing proprietary data. It gives high fidelity representation of the radiator for an accurate characterization of the final scenario. It provides a representation of the physical antenna. So, real materials, real feeling conditions, real mechanical design. And it allows to solve enormous realistic problems that are considered too big to be simulated or to be measured. But let's skip now to the second task of this workshop. So, the effective procedure on the basis of the combination of measured and simulated data. Have a look now at the workflow that implements the combination of measurement and simulation. The example depicted in this slide is a sharp fin antenna that has been measured, post-processed and simulated placed on a car model. The workflow consists of three steps. The first stage is the measurement of the radiation pattern of the device under test. It is preferable to start by a near-field measurement since the near field contains more electromagnetic information with respect to the far field. But even only far field is available, it can be any way efficiently post-processed. The second step is the post-processing of the radiation pattern by the equivalent current method that allows to prepare a near field source or organs box that in step three is important in one of the computational electromagnetic tools and simulated place or integrated in a more complex scenario. We start to present in details the first step, so the radiating measurement of the antenna. The main antenna parameters are evaluated on the far field pattern. The far field region is the zone of the free space where the relative angular field distribution is independent of the distance from the antenna. The spherical wave front of an antenna becomes a plane wave. The effect is to equally expose the device under test to a plane wave from the probe. A simple way to measure the radiation pattern at far field distance is to record the coupling S21 matrix for each direction between the antenna under test and the probe antenna. Near field measurement systems allow for detection of electromagnetic fields radiated by microwave devices at near field zone. For near field to far field transformation, the acquisition of amplitude and phase information is required, while only tangential e field information is satisfying. Very efficient transformations are applied on data acquired by spherical and cylindrical ranges. Performing a near-field measurement lists the following advantages. Small attenuations due to the short distances, maximizing the dynamic range, possibility to use a shielded anechoic chamber for minimizing reflections. All these proper conditions allow us to get ideal far-field conditions by using near-field expansion techniques. The near-field expansion technique here presented is based on the spherical waves. If the near field measurement is performed in a spherical range, the radiated field can be written as a summation of spherical waves or modes with proper weighted coefficients. The coefficients express the power related to each mode and all can be plotted in two dimensional graphs representing the power spectrum. The coefficients are determined solving by FFT, the coupling integral between the antenna under test and the probe. Far field pattern is obtained starting by these coefficients by the formula shown on this slide by letting the radius r tending to infinite. I would show you here a typical power spectrum of a scaled automotive scenario using a reduced car model that has been measured in a near field system. The two plots are related to the tangential electric and magnetic modes that completely define and represent the radiated field.
After this explanation on near field and far field measurements, I would present the multi probe technology. The idea of using an array of identical probes with fast electronic scan to speed up the measurement time is the obvious solution, but the robust engineering of such solution is a significant task. MVG implementing this technology in their near field systems and a typical example of spherical range is here represented. The near field spherical scan is performed in elevation electronically by an array of probes distributed on a heart, while the azimuth scan is performed by mechanical rotation of the device under test by a turntable from 0 to 180 degrees. At the end of the measurement, a complete spherical scan is performed. This technology allows to obtain very fast measurement time, such as a few minutes, with a device under test of diameter less than 10 wavelengths for more than 20 frequency points. The first multiprobe ranges were installed in the period 1996-1999. Initially, the frequency range was 800 MHz to 3.2 GHz, later extended to 400 MHz to 6 GHz. Multiprobe means that a probe array is used to substitute at least one mechanical movement with fast electronic scan. Thus, this technology is not regarding exclusively spherical ranges, but it can be extended also to cylindrical or planar measurements. Some examples of ranges are here depicted. For near field systems, the use of multiprobe technology against two single probe ranges is highly recommended since it allows to gain time while obtaining very accurate results. Some examples of probe arrays are shown in this slide. These cover the frequency range from 70 MHz to 50 GHz. Array combinations and probe design are different depending on the frequency sum ranges. Probe array based measurement solutions can be implemented for testing a very large range of scenarios, such as vehicles, aircraft, antennas of small and medium dimensions, up to MIMO testing. Finally, probe array based measurement solutions are widely accepted as reported in the IEEE recommended practice for near field antenna measurements. The measurements that will be shown during this workshop have been performed by the MVG multiprobe systems. Let's proceed now with the second step of the workflow. This is the preparation of the near field source from the measure radiation pattern in terms of equivalent currents by the inverse source method. This near field source is an Huygens box that will be used as excitation of the electromagnetic simulations. We will show this operation more in details during the following slides. The inverse source method, or also called the equivalent current method, is implemented in the software inside. Starting from a near field or far field measure radiation pattern, defining a three dimensional geometry conformal and representing the antenna, this method reconstructs the equivalent electric and magnetic currents related to the radiator under test. Here, a horn measure in the StarLab near field system, that is a multiprobe near field system of a radius of 45 cm, is represented with the related post-processing workflow. From the distribution of the equivalent currents, is it possible to uh, understand better how the antenna is working and if results are in agreement to expectation from the antenna design? The more detailed geometry, the more diagnostics information is available. In case the user would export and apply the equivalent currents as measured near field sourcing simulation, it is not needed to operate with such detailed geometry, but a simple box has been already validated as accurate near field source for exchanging data. The box has been selected since it is the simple and common geometry type imported as near field source 
by all and most the simulation tools. But let's go to discover the origin and the motivation of the inverse source method. The inverse source technique implements the integral equation rigorously based on the application of the equivalence theorem. This allows to substitute the antenna under test by a closed surface all enclosing the antenna, where the equivalent sources are placed. This equivalent surface is denoted by sigma r. Currents are imposed to radiate the original field wherever is measured. The measurement domain is denoted by sigma m. The system of equation is discretized by the method of moments with Rao Wilson Gleason's basing functions, and the condition of zero internal field guarantees the uniqueness of the system solution. The integral equation approach constitutes the complement of more established tools such as plane waves or spherical wave expansions, and it affords a greater generality and flexibility since it allows reconstructing source or fields on arbitrary U-specified surface. Flexibility is also allowed in sampling rates and with respect to availability of only some field components, within the obvious physical limitation of implied information quantity. The equivalent current method can be applied to process any antenna measured data such as near field data and far field data. An example of passive slot array operating in X band is here presented, showing how starting from different scan surface and measurement system, the equivalent currents can be reconstructed efficiently leading a good comparison of the results. Let's continue with focusing the use of the inverse source method for preparation of near-field sources for computation electromagnetic tools. And so we arrive at the last step of the workflow, where the near-field measure source is used in the simulations. For demonstration, I will present some examples during the last part of the workshop, by the use of different computation electromagnetic tools. But before skipping to the second task of the workshop, that is dedicated to the validation campaign of the link between measurements and simulation, I would describe for a few minutes some additional features of the equivalent current method. These features are really interesting and are about antenna diagnostics. This allows to complete the explanation of the inverse source method. Results from the inverse source method can be used for many purposes, such as for antenna provide in-depth understanding of antenna radiation, for investigating measurement setup and filter your measurements by the effect of the surroundings, for calculations starting from the currents the field very close to the antenna, and generally in heavy points around the antenna even far field. Then it can be used for EMC analysis and to detect spurious radiation, and finally, for data interpolation and extrapolation. We will proceed now to present each of these application areas in details. But let's start with the first feature, antenna diagnostics and provide in-depth understanding of antenna radiation. For showing this functionality, we use a linear array antenna, which near field pattern has been measured at 1930 megahertz. Here an overlay of the antenna with its radiation pattern is illustrated. The pattern together with the reconstruction geometry are the inputs for the calculation of the current. The geometry is conformal to the antenna and it has been discretized by a triangular mesh. This is the distribution of the equivalent currents in amplitude. Amplitude and phase of the currents on each mesh element can be exactly quantified. Thanks to this feature, the user can compare on a certain position or on areas the different amplitude and phase values. Here we specifically compare the amplitude of the different array elements 
to check compliance with the specifications. In terms of amplitude, the results are in agreement with the specifications, where asymmetry is expected with respect to the horizontal plane that divides the antenna into blocks of four elements. We analyze now the phase distribution of the currents. We expect the same symmetry as for the amplitude, but this is not the case. Indeed, there is a unexpected delta between the second and the seventh elements of the array. This is a clear alert that something is not working properly in the antenna. Thanks to this information, we investigated specifically that part of the feeding network and we found a problem in one of the connectors. That connector has been immediately fixed thanks to this fast diagnostic. Post-processing of currents for this antenna took up minutes at this frequency. This is a classical example of an antenna diagnostics really useful for checking the antenna manufacturing and production. The next feature is the antenna diagnostics and filtering. The currents can be reconstructed not only on the antenna, but on the complete or part of the measurement setup. So discovering an antenna surroundings interaction is feasible such as positioner or mounting structures. But after detection of a problem and its motivation, we can do more. For example, we can spatial filtering the awarded radiation by switching off to zero the currents corresponding to that disturbance. To show this functionality, we consider as example a sleeve dipole. Here the design of the antenna is depicted and the antenna is composed by two radiators and a choke for minimizing the interaction with a feeding cable. For our test, we voluntarily removed the choke from the antenna to create an interaction with the cable in the measurement setup. The near field pattern of the antenna has been measured in the Starlab system at 1800 MHz. This is the near field measure radiation pattern. It is immediately clear that this is not the classical cardioid shape that we expect from a dipole. A ripple in the lower hemispherical part of the pattern is present, and this shows, of course, that a problem occurred during the measurements. So let's have a look at the measurement setup and for better understanding, we observe it with the near field radiation pattern overlaid. A feeding cable is present on the setup together with the polystyrene mast. Since we would investigate the distribution of the currents on both antenna and cable, we consider our cylinder as reconstruction geometry, including and representing both of them. Applying the inverse source method, we can get the distribution of the equivalent currents on both antenna and cable. In this slide, we show the electrical currents that are the most relevant for this antenna. By observation of the currents, a relevant level is detected on the cable, especially just below the antenna. This shows the strong interaction of the cable due to the chalk missing. So, the problem has been found, but what we can do more than this? We could try to filter the currents on the cable, switching off those currents to zero. This functionality is called filtering. The filtering removes the undesired currents, and the radiation pattern from this new set of currents after filtering can be calculated. In this test case, we are able to remove the undesired effect of the currents on the cable and to clean the radiation pattern that now is the expected cardioid. This feature is really general since the set of the filtered currents can be arbitrarily decided by the user. We move on to another functionality that is called near field, near field transformations. This feature allows to calculate the E and H field in every location outside the reconstruction geometry in very near field, near field and far field zone. Volumetric regular grid can be defined for field calculation from the currents. 
The radiation embedded with phase animation can be visualized. Some examples are shown in this slide for different antennas. We show a sleeve dipole, a standard gain horn, and a linear array. When we perform a near field or far field measurements, the field is calculated on a surface. By the equivalent currents from a single acquisition on a scanned surface, the field on a very large domain can be easily reconstructed. This is an innovative approach for calculating safety perimeters, the evaluation of power densities, and for measurement security and normative. In particular, MVG and Sony Mobile Communications have been recently published a study that demonstrates that applying the equivalent current method represents a valid approach for evaluating power density curves and verifying compliance with normatives. In this slide, a Sony Mobile phone under test is shown during the measurement in the StarLab 50 GHz system. From the measured radiation pattern, the equivalent currents on a box representing the device are calculated, and from currents, the field on the different surface from the device are computed with the corresponding power density. The following application regards EMC and detect spurious radiation. All electronic devices present in commercial products and integrated in their intended enclosure need to be tested using EMC method. Tests include verifying the radiation emissions from the devices to be compliant with the EMC requirements. At this purpose, equivalent currents reveal spurious radiation and pinpoint sources. Then, thanks to the previous functionality, so the near field near field transformations, the user starting from the currents can calculate the field values at precise distances, such as 3 meters. An example of device under test consists of a PCB working in the frequency band from 30 MHz to 1 GHz, shown in this slide. The emission from the PCB is very low. Indeed, the power absorbed by the load is higher than 90-90%. Spherical near field measurement of the PCB has been performed in the StarLab system. The measure pattern has been post-processed by the equivalent current method. The electric and magnetic current are shown on the right. Let's skip now to the last feature that consists of interpolation and extrapolation. Antenna installed in modern cars are often highly integrated. In such cases, the entire vehicle is contributing to the radiated field, in particular at lower frequencies such as VHF. The complete characterization of the full vehicle is thus typically required. For frequency down to 70 MHz, a widely accepted and cost-effective solution is a multi-probe spherical near-field system in which the scanning area is truncated below the horizon to minimizing the system dimensions. An example of automotive system is shown in this slide on the left, while on the right, a typical near-field pattern measured in such system is reported. The partial near-field acquisition for such system leads to truncation errors if standard near-field to far-field transformation is applied. The equivalent current method can be used as tool for reconstructing the field over the wall sphere, allowing a mitigation of truncation error in general measurement scenarios. Starting from the measured near-field or far-field data, the electric and magnetic currents can be computed on an arbitrary shaped reconstruction surface all enclosing the device. Then, from the currents, the radiated field is calculated again, but over the wall sphere. A simple block diagram regarding the use of the equivalent currents as near-field far-field transformation tool for truncated spherical near-field dataset is here reported. As we can see, the truncated near-field dataset 
is directly used without performing any fin padding, which would result in a discontinuous and unphysical field. The equivalent current computation is in fact a minimum energy operator on the truncated region, which allows for a direct computation of the currents, avoiding errors caused by the processing of a discontinuous field. From the computed equivalent currents, the far field is finally evaluated over the full sphere, completing the near field far field transformation process. Alternatively, it's also possible to recompute the near field on the spherical surface and then apply the standard near field to far field transformation. This completes the list of the features regarding diagnostics and analysis. And we arrive now at the second part of the workshop. This part is dedicated to the campaign carried out to validate the approach of combining measurement and simulation together. Different test cases have been selected to test the methodology. For each test case, the measurement of the source antenna, the near field source processed by the equivalent currents and the final placement are here reported. The first test case consists of a reflector fed by a horn. The second test case consists of a monocon antenna offset mounted on a rectangular flat plate. In this scenario, the antenna is a low directive radiator and it is flush mounted with respect to the horn that fits the reflector. The third test case consists of an open-ended waveguide antenna placed in the same position of the monocon on the plate. The difference with the monocon is that the open-ended waveguide antenna has a polarization that is parallel to the plate, while in the monocon this is vertical. A monocon installed on a space plane mock-up model is the last scenario considered for this validation. In this case, the placement is on a curved surface with respect to the other investigated in the campaign. We start with the first example consisting of the reflector. The reflector and the feeder are shown in this slide with details and overall dimensions. The Horner frequency band is from 4 to 40 gigahertz. In antenna design, the placement and type of a feeder depend on the design of the reflector, so during the design process could be really useful to make simulations with the real manufacturer prototype with respect of using all these simulations. Another advantage is that after measurement of the feeder and its characterization in terms of measured source, this can be simulated with different models of reflectors, so in this case, we can predict the expected performance. The general advantage, as we mentioned during the introduction of the workshop, is that using the real antenna allows to represent the radiator with the real materials and real mechanical and electric characteristics. So, in case if no CAD model is available, no large measurement system is available, for measuring the wool reflector or for testing the reflector with the real feeder, we can measure the real radiator in the star lab and we can get to the radiation pattern. The star lab is a, a reduced measurement system with an arch radius uh, of 45 cm, so it's not so big to measure the reflector, but in this system the ordner can be stayed and measured very efficiently. And this is a system that, uh, uh, due to the dimension, can be allocated or available in a not so large laboratory for antenna testing. Then, from the radiation pattern, thanks to the inverse source method, a Noigas box in terms of equivalent currents is computed. The electric and magnetic currents at 8 gigahertz are here represented. The computed measure near field source can be used for simulations. For this campaign, we provided the same near field source dataset to all the software vendors without any additional information about the antenna design, electric or magnetic properties. The complete reflector antenna 
has been simulated using the CAD model of the reflector and the Huygens box fitted. The participants were responsible for generating a suitable mesh to import the measure source in the Huygens box format and to control the numerical stability of the simulations. Depending on the tool, the reflector has been simulated by different numerical methods, such as time domain, method of moments, finite element method. The powerful of this approach using the equivalent currents is that the near field source can be used by every numerical method able to manage an August box with internal field equal to zero. The participants performed simulation without knowing any information about the others. The results have been provided by the different testers to MVG who compared the patterns among them and with a reference measurement of the full reflector. This was the philosophy adopted to preserve the spirit and the validity of the validation campaign. The reference measurement of the full reflector has been done in the Stargate 64 near field multiprobe system in Paris, that is a larger version of multiprobe system with respect to the Star Lab used for the measurement of the Horner standalone. But before presenting the results, I would show how this approach is efficient for this test case. Since the equivalent currents can produce a form-fitting representation of the antenna surface, the source antenna can be mounted more freely in any position or any large structure. See, for example, how the ore can be positioned directly on the arm of the reflector. This method is recommended as opposed to spherical wave expansion. In spherical wave expansion, only the field radiated outside the minimal sphere of the source antenna can be computed. This sphere of minimum radius wholly enclosing the source antenna must not be detected by the structure. Therefore, the source antenna cannot be stored too close to the structure. As a result, this approach can be applied only to a limited number of practical test cases. For this reason, the equivalent current approach is winning for many applications. Let's proceed now to show the results. The analysis is shown at 8 gigahertz. In this slide, we report the plots of the copolar directivity, precisely the E-plane, and we compare the reference antenna in black color with the simulated data provided by the different software vendors. The forward hemisphere pattern has been used in the comparison and the different simulation of the reflector with the horn uh, feeding it as measured source are in excellent agreement considering differences in numerical method and internal treatment of the imported field near field source. The agreement between simulation and measurement is very good considering the approximation due to the feed uh, representation and uncertainties arising from measurement, manufacturing and simulation. We need to consider also that the participants use different numerical methods. Indeed, uh, CST use a time domain method, FICO and ADF use the method of moments, while HFSS use a finite uh, element method. But in order to quantify better the accuracy of the results, again for the E-plane, we consider the equivalent noise level as parameter for evaluation. The equivalent noise level, also known as ENL, is the weighted difference between the simulation for all the participants and the measure reference. The ENL is calculated by this formula here reported, and uh, the curves for all, all the participants and the reference measurements are shown in this plot. Let's skip now to the other cut plane, so the H plane. Again, the simulated directivity patterns from all the participants are shown together with the reference, and also here the agreement is very good. We calculated the equivalent noise level also for the H-plane, 
and the different curves are reported here for all the participants. We can note here the existing agreement between the tools that use the method of moments, such as FICO and ADF. To numerically check the results, the linear average of all the ENL at all the angles on both the cut planes are calculated and reported in the first table. The general correlation between simulation and measurement is around 40 dB, which is similar to what can be obtained by the full wave simulation of the antenna. This result is very good, confirming the accuracy of the measured source representation and the validity of the link between measurement and simulations. The measured and simulated peak directivity values of the reflector at 8 GHz are reported in the second table. The label mass is for measure reference, while the other results are from the participants. The table confirms the very good agreement between measurements and simulations. Let's continue with the second test case of the validation campaign, consisting of the monocon antenna offset mounted on a flat rectangular plate. This example has been selected to investigate the use of measurements in the simulation of flash-mounted antennas on large complex structures. The source antenna is an MVG SMC2200 monocon antenna, as uh, is shown in, uh, in the picture on the left of this slide. The antenna is mounted in a corner of the plate at 1.5 wavelength and 2 wavelength distance from the nearest edges at the validation frequency of 5.28 gigahertz. The validation structure is shown in the picture on the right during the measurement in the StarLab multiprobe measurement system. This is the measurement that will be used as reference in the comparison with the simulation tools. The determination of the electromagnetic models of the source antenna for flash-mounted application is more difficult than situation where the antenna is detached from the scattering structure. The proximity of scattering modifies the current distribution on the antenna itself. An infinite ground plane boundary condition is a good approximation, but such condition cannot be directly obtained on a realistic measurement scenario. However, this condition can be emulated from measurements of the source antenna on a finite ground plane. The post-processing of the measured data eliminates the diffractive contribution from the edge of the finite ground plane, creating the wanted infinite ground plane boundary condition. A circular ground plane with minimum two wavelength diameter is considered adequate for most measurement source antennas. In this validation example, the monocon antenna has been measured on a circular ground plane of even 7 wavelength diameter, so this condition is largely satisfied. After post-processing to eliminate edge diffraction, the three-dimensional electromagnetic models in form of equivalent electric and magnetic currents associated to the source can be evaluated by the inverse source method on a box representing the antenna. Here the box is represented in red color. It should be noted that since an infinite ground plane condition is considered, the image of the source antenna is initially included in the equivalent current computation and then removed when determining the Huygens box representing the measured source. The complete workflow is shown in this slide. The monocon antenna on a finite circular ground plane has been measured in the StarLab system. Here the radiation pattern of the antenna at 5.28 GHz is reported. The shape of the pattern is affected by the diffractive effect of the finite ground plane. Then the virtual ground plane condition is applied in order to obtain an infinite ground plane condition. This infinite ground condition guarantees that the antenna is independent to what can be around it, 
and thus it is possible to reconstruct the equivalent currents on a box representing the antenna only. Finally, the near field source related to the antenna can be imported and placed in a generic position in a generic scenario. In this example, the measured source has been used in the simulation tool on a plate. As for the reflector, let's proceed now to the results. In this slide, the plot of the copolar directivity at phi equal to zero degree is reported. This vertical cut plane is parallel to the longer side of the plate. The comparison is between the reference measurement in black color and the simulated data provided by the different software vendors. The full hemisphere pattern has been used in this comparison. The different simulation on the plate with the monocon as measured source are in excellent agreement among them considering differences in numerical methods and internal treatment of the imported near field source. Also, the agreement with the measurement is really good. The agreement or correlation between simulation and measurement has been evaluated in terms of equivalent noise level between measured and simulated pattern. The measured far field has been considered as the reference. An overlay of the equivalent noise level for each simulation tool with the reference measurement at 5 equal to 0 degree is here reported. The comparison of the copolar directivity at 5 equal to 90 degree is instead here represented. This is the vertical cut plane that is parallel to the shorter side of the plate. The comparison is between the reference measurement in black color and the simulated data uh, by the different software vendors. This comparison shows that the agreement uh, between the different results is very good for the different participants. The equivalent noise level on this cut plane is here represented and uh, it is shown for all the participants against the reference measurements. The average of the ENL for all the participants have been calculated and uh, the values are reported in the table number one. The average correlation between simulation and measurement is around 30 dB, which is uh, similar to what can be obtained by the full wave simulation of the antenna. This is a good result that confirms the accuracy of the measure source representation and the validity of the method implementing the link between measurement and simulation. Then the measured and simulated peak directivities at uh, 5.28 gigahertz are represented in uh, the second table. The label MERS is uh, uh, representing the measured reference from MVG, while the other labels represent the different simulation tools. Very good agreement between measurement and simulation can be found. These results conclude the test case of the monocon antenna on the rectangular plate. I will now show during this workshop the other two test cases of the validation, but only for a matter of time. But I could say that uh, these have been published during the past UCAP events, revealing you the accuracy of the method and confirming its validity. After a complete explanation of the link between measurement and simulation and the validation campaign, we move to the third part of the workshop that deals about some applications. I will present a GNSS antenna on Sentinel satellite, a shark fin antenna on a car model, an example of power density calculation, and an enhancement of the assessment of antenna coupling. We start with the first application. The GNSS antenna and Sentinel satellite structure have been designed, manufactured and measured by RUAC Space in the frame of the Global Monitoring for Environment and Security Missions. This study regards the satellite model of the mission Sentinel-1. The antenna model analyzed in this satellite model consists of two stacked patches placed in a short cylindrical cap. 
The GNSS antenna is characterized by a pencil beam type pattern within minus plus 70 degree of coverage working at frequencies between 1227 MHz to 1575 MHz. The goal of this applicative example is to show how the antenna can be measured standalone and its radiation pattern on the satellite model can be predicted by using the link between measurement and simulation. Specifically, we will use a CST Studio Suite in this application. This is the workflow of the link. The first step consists of measurement of the antenna. We start from far field pattern in this example and the radiation pattern has been measured by workspace. The second step is the preparation of the near field source by the equivalent current method, while the third step is importing the measured source in CST Studio Suite and simulating uh, the antenna on the satellite model. Here, the preparation of the measured source from the radiation pattern is reported at 1227 megahertz. Starting from the pattern and defining our reconstruction geometry as a box, this is the distribution of the computed electric equivalent currents. The computed Huygens box representing the antenna has been imported in CST Studio Suite and positioned on the spacecraft model as is shown in the slide. As the source is imported in CST is managed as the other simulated source that can be rotated, translated in order to position it in the final location. Here the electric and magnetic field of the source are illustrated. MVG perform the simulations of the result reported here. This is another representation of the source, the E field by phase variation. The simulation has been done by Integral Equation Solver, and here the mesh domain is represented. Other methods can be used by the near field source as input, like time domain and others. Finally, this is an example of a far field pattern simulated by the measured source on the satellite, and the three dimensional directivity pattern, specifically the copolar component, is illustrated. Let's continue now with the second example, a sharp fin antenna on a car model. The antenna under test has been designed and manufactured by Calearo. The antenna has been measured in uh, the GSM, LTE and UMTS frequency bands from 698 MHz to 2690 MHz. Since also this test case is a flash mounted antenna as the monocon, we adopted the same procedure previously described. The antenna has been measured on a circular ground plane, then the edge scattering from a finite ground plane has been extracted to get an infinite ground plane condition. The complete workflow is shown in the slide. The sharpening antenna on a finite circular ground plane has been measured in the Starlab system. Here, the radiation pattern of the antenna at 925 MHz is illustrated. Then, the virtual ground plane condition is applied, and now the antenna is independent to what can be around it, and thus it is possible to reconstruct the equivalent current on a box representing the antenna only. In this test case, the measured source has been used in the simulation tool Alter FIGO. The Huygens box has been imported in FIGO and simulated after placement on a car model. The results from FIGO simulation are reported in the following slides. In this slide, the three-dimensional and two-dimensional plus radiation patterns are shown at all the three investigated frequency points by variations versus frequency. Then, also the induced surface current by the antenna on the vehicle have been simulated as shown in this slide. The effect of the vehicle body has been also investigated at all the three working frequency points, 
Comparison between considering or not the vehicle body in the simulation is here reported in terms of radiation pattern. Antenna radiation has been analyzed on the two principal cut planes. Finally, the effect of antenna positioning on three-dimensional radiation pattern was studied, selecting four antenna positions on the car, as is shown on the left of the slide. We can observe from the plot on the right that the variations are small at all the investigated frequency points by antenna position variation. The third application that I would show you is about power density calculation. 5G communication is the next evolution in wireless data services to provide data rates up to 10 gigabytes per second at millimeter wave. All devices and products radiating millimeter wave electromagnetic fields need to be tested to comply with radio frequency safety guidelines for human exposure, such as those recommended by the International Commission on Non Ionizing Radiation Protection. The human exposure to millimeter wave antennas operating in the immediate vicinity of human bodies was studied in the past. From frequency higher than 10 GHz, the fundamental exposure metric is defined in terms of incident power density rather than the specific absorption rate. This change is due to the small penetration depth of the radio frequency fields and the electrical dimensions of the devices that becomes cumbersome to measure at higher frequencies. Moreover, the electrically large dimensions of the device under test at high frequencies can require long testing time for measurement of the power density in the proximity of the devices. A recent technique to accurately determine power density in the close vicinity to a device is based on the near-field measurement and processing by the inverse source method. The method has been initially investigated on a 5G mm wave mobile terminal from Sony Mobile Communications and results will be shown in the following slides. The antenna has been measured at millimeter wave frequencies in the Starlab 50 GHz near field system. That is a version of the Starlab system, but for measurement of 5G devices. The equivalent currents of the antenna have been determined by the inverse source method. The power density has been determined by importing the currents in the form of an OES box in a numerical simulation tool able to calculate the field radiating by the currents and consequently the power density curves. The device under test is represented here. The 5G mobile terminal mockup contains 10 antenna elements. The dimensions of the mockup are shown in the picture on the right. The casing is made of PCAPS of permittivity 3.5 with thickness 1 mm and the display is made of plexiglass with thickness 0.7 mm. The antennas are printed on Roger substrate with thickness 0.3 mm mounted on the chassis. The mockup contains four kinds of canonical antenna elements operating around 28 gigahertz, including dipoles represented by port 1 and port 10, notches port 2, port 3, 8, and 9, slots, port 4 and uh, 7, and patch, port 5 and 6. All the elements are fed through 50 ohm microstrip lines connected with 50 ohms PCB connectors. Here the measurements of the mobile phone mockup with the dipole fed is presented. The dipole is located in one of the edge of the mobile the geometry of the construction is shown with the triangular mesh. The equivalent currents are calculated by the measured radiation pattern at uh, 28 gigahertz, and in particular, the distribution of the electric currents is here reported. A peak of the currents in correspondence of the location where the antenna is integrated is clearly visible. This operation has been performed for all the antennas on the device.
This study has two purposes. Make a first diagnostics of all the antennas on the mobile and then using the currents for power density calculation. This slide presents the reconstructed and simulated equivalent current results. The reconstructed count from the measured patterns plus the equivalent currents meted, while the others come from the full wave simulated pattern post processed by the inverse source method. Generally, the reconstructed equivalent currents agree very well with the simulated ones. The slots on the and the patch have wider equivalent current distribution, while the dipole and the notch have more constraint equivalent current distribution. For the dipole and the notch, a portion of the reconstructed equivalent currents can be observed in the corner stronger than the simulated ones in the same location. This may be attributed to the uh, fabrication discrepancy and cable defects. When implementing antennas into the mobile terminals in practice, the precise and complete information of mechanical and electronic characteristics needed for full wave simulation is unavailable. In particular, it is critical at millimeter wave frequencies, where the surrounding components have remarkable effects on the radiation performance. But let's go to the workflow in order to explore what we can do with the reconstructed equivalent currents. The first analysis is for diagnostics. Indeed, by an exploration of the equivalent currents, we can check the agreement with the expected results, and in case some undesired currents are detected, this can be filtered to solve a problem. Remember before the analysis during the first task of the workshop on the cable feeding the sleeve dipole. Here, a typical analysis on the dipole of the mobile mockup is reported. Relevant currents are on the lower part of the mobile, and this is not expected from the original mobile and antenna design. The, this doesn't occur so much for the patch antenna, where this effect is stayed less evident. These undesired currents on the lower part of the PCB have been filtered and switched to zero. The near field before and after filtering is displayed for both the antennas. It is evident that for the patch antenna, the radiation pattern does not change so much by the filtering, while for the dipole, the radiation pattern changed drastically. This confirmed that for the dipole, the equivalent currents represent something that affects strongly the antenna radiation pattern. Additionally to diagnostics, power density calculation is also possible and the workflow is depicted in this slide. From the currents, the near feed on an arbitrary scan surfaces is calculated in vicinity of the device under test and then the power density curves are evaluated. The near field can be calculated directly by the currents using the near field near field transformations or importing the current as Wiggins box into the simulation tools. An example of a near field reconstruction is shown in the slide. This is the representation of the Sony mobile. The near field has been calculated on a regular grid and closed into a sphere of radius 45 cm. This is the radius of the Starlab system used for performing the original near field measurements. The calculated pattern is the representation of the field inside the measurement arch that otherwise is not possible to acquire with the direct near field measurement, but thanks to the equivalent current method can be anyway evaluated. In this slide state, the near field calculated by the currents on a plane in front of the device is represented. This is the dipole radiating and it's immediately clear how strong is the undesired radiation from the edge of the mobile that we have analyzed before in this section dedicated to the diagnostics. Starting from the currents, 
the incident power density by the radiated E and H complex field is calculated on different planes at different distances. Here only one plane is shown for simplicity. This operation has been done for both and measure the simulated Huygens box. The measure box is done by the measurement plus the equivalent current method, while the simulated box that has the same dimensions of the measure one is obtained by CST Studio Suite by directly applying the inverse source method. International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection stipulates that the incident power density should be averaged by 20 square centimeter and the U.S. Federal Communications Commission proposed that it should be averaged by one square centimeter. The spatial peak average power density can be expressed by the formula here reported, where E and H are the electric field and the conjugate magnetic field respectively. In this slide, the maximum spatial average power density versus the distance V above the mock-up is represented. Discrepancy can be observed between the measured power density and the simulated one due to the positioning error. The results suggest an error of about 3-4 mm. This can be improved by better knowledge of the position of the antenna in the testing setup while the maximum spatial average power density with 20 square centimeter shows more robust to the measurement error. Correlations presented for the Sony Mobile were promising, but some discrepancies were likely due to the approximated numerical model and the positioning errors. An MVG QR8000 quad read horn with well-known full wave model is investigated to validate the power density determination against accurate simulation. Again, the device under test, as for the Sony Mobile, has been measured in the Starlab system. The antenna under test is here presented. The closed wide band quad read horn is a dual linearly polarized reference radiator used as reference antenna for gain calibration of antenna measurement systems or as wideband probes in classical far-field test ranges. Here, both the simulated model in CST Studio Suite and the real antenna in the measurement system are represented. For both real antenna and the simulated model, the radiation pattern has been determined. The equivalent current method has been applied on both data sets as is described on the current slide by this workflow. From these Huygens boxes, the radiated field and the spatial average power density have been calculated as for the Sony Mobile device under test that we presented before. In this slide, the power density computed from the pointing vector directed along Z at 0.3 cm from the aperture with an average area of 1 square centimeter and 4 square centimeter is represented. The plots on the left correspond to the power density Z component, while the plots on the right correspond to the power density total component. An equivalent representation of the simulated results is here reported. As you can see, the results from uh, measurement and simulation are really similar to the measured data. Finally, the analysis of the average power density varying the distance from the aperture of the device has been done. Both measurement and simulation are shown. Maximum deviation is 0.46 dB for 1 square centimeter and 0.33 dB for 4 square centimeter. The agreement between measurement and simulation power density results is very good. We are continuously working to enrich the validation process by new examples and measured data. We arrived at the fourth application that consists of an enhancement of the assessment of antenna coupling. 
The aim of this example is to present the applicability of the method in the evaluation of port-to-port -port coupling between a physical antenna in which measurements are available but a full-wave model is unavailable and the other antennas that are simulated. The investigation has been performed on a three-element array of uh, cavity-backed cross dipoles in slant minus plus 45 degree polarization. The central element is considered the physical antenna with available measured data, while the other elements are simulated. The simulated pattern and the antenna coupling following the procedure are compared to the measurements of the full three-element array for validation. The validation of the working procedure combining measurements of a single element and simulation of the coupling with the other elements consists of the following steps. The first one is the measurement of the single element of the array in isolation, and then the creation of the measured near field source representation. The near field source can be imported in the simulation tools and placed in the array configuration. Numerical simulation of the antenna coupling between the measured model and the other two elements of the linear array is here presented. CSD Studio Suite has been used for the simulations. The single element of the array consisting of a cavity back cross dipole antenna has been measured in the Starlab system in the frequency range from 1.7 to 2.2 gigahertz. Minus 45 degree port is fed during the measurement. Here only the current on 1940 megahertz are shown but the near-field equivalent current representation of the antenna have been determined at five frequency points here reported. The plus 45 degree port is loaded with 50 ohms. The frequency points under test has been selected in the frequency range where the antenna efficiency is maximized in order to get as much information as possible from the dynamic range of the radiation pattern. The near field source has been imported in CST Studio Suite as measured source, and the coupling and the radiation pattern simulated in the presence of the lateral elements are shown in these slides. Anyway, this is a general procedure that can be potentially applied to all the numerical tools able to manage the antenna coupling between the different ports. The ports 1, 3, and 5 are copolarized, while the port 2, 4 and 6 are cross polarized. Only the port 1 is exited, while the other ports are receiving. Parameters such as inter element coupling between the elements and the embedded pattern are simulated. The accuracy of the analysis is investigated by comparing the simulation with radiated measurements of the full three element array. We report here the comparison in terms of directivity radiation pattern between measurements and simulation with the measured source. The part uh, uh, considered for this analysis is the number one that corresponds to minus 45 degree. The cut plane represented is phi equal to zero degree. We present here the coupling of the measured central elements with the other elements of the array. Part one that corresponds to minus 45 degree is fed and ports 3, 4, 5 and 6 of the other elements are receiving. The comparison between simulation and measurement of the full array is here reported. Finally, the coupling average values over the range that we have investigated in this study are here represented. Deviation between the measure and simulated S31 and S51 correspond to 1.40 dB and 2.19 dB. The good agreement of the results shows the validity of the proposed method for evaluation of port-to-port -port coupling between a physical antenna in which only measured data are available, while the other antennas are only simulated. This example concludes the section of the applications of the link between measurement and simulations.
The combination between measured and simulated data is a general approach that can be implemented for measured data of all the systems. To get compatibility with the inside software that implements the inverse search method, you need to organize your measured data, if in the real part and imaginary part, in a simple ASCII format that is accepted by insight. Finally, this is a general method that can be applied to all the computational electromagnetic tools, able to manage near field search in form of Huygens boxes and antenna simulations. We arrive at the end of the workshop. Here, summary and conclusion are reported. The motivation for combining measurement and simulation in antenna application has been introduced focusing on advantages on the link with the commercial electromagnetic tools. The workflow of the link has been presented in details with special attention to the radiation measurement process and to the inverse search method for reconstructing the equivalent currents and preparing the measured near field source. Both diagnostics features and link with the computational electromagnetic tools of the inverse source method have been presented. The validation campaign of the link has been presented with the aim of identifying the accuracy level that this method can offer in the electromagnetic analysis. Finally, a set of different types of applications has been presented, such as two antenna placement problems with different computational electromagnetic tools, the power density evaluation and the improvement of assessment of antenna coupling. Thank you for attending our workshop. For more information and questions, you can contact MVG. You can use the email address here reported. We will be glad to answer to your questions. Thank you and goodbye.